views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Get ready for a game changer. Sarah Westall is bringing you Business Game Changers Radio. Mondays at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sarah will bring you leading experts, visionaries, and newsmakers who provide the best commentary on big issues and cutting-edge innovations. Sarah's 20 years as a business executive will help you think like an entrepreneur with expertise, energy, and attitude. Now here's your host, Sarah Westall. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall, and you're listening to Conscious Business Radio on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. Today, I am going to be talking about freedom of the press with Delphine Helgand, and she is the one that runs the the um, Reporters Without Borders for the United States. She is the lead researcher for that organization. Reporters Without Borders is an independent organization that is not affiliated with any or with any newspaper or any, any other media organization. And they work hard to be to be independent. But the concern that I have is that the United States is ranked 49th out of 180 countries. And that's pretty bad. Why are we ranked in our freedom of the press at 49th? And we're going to dive into that with her and find out what the deal is. And, you know, my concern is that if we do not have freedom of the press and there are certain powers that are controlling it, are we investing in the right businesses are we making the right political decisions? Are we getting the candidates in front of us that we want to see? Are we are we getting propaganda fed to us on a nonstop base, basis that feeds us in the direction of the people who are in control versus the ideas of everyone so that we can see both sides of a situation and make our own mind up? You know, we're not going to be investing in the right things for this country or for this world if we don't have the information in our hands. Every business leader knows that in order to make a really good decision, you need to have the facts and the information in front of you. If you're only getting part of the facts, part of the information, your decisions are going to be inherently bad. You're going to make the wrong decisions because you don't know what's really going on. And so if we are operating on this basis nonstop year after year, what are we doing? And the concern that I have is that the world index is actually going down. Freedom of the press is going down everywhere, which is really strange. The the internet has actually exploded and opened up our ability to communicate. So it I think that we're in a renaissance of information and we have more chances than ever to be educated. But the majority of the people don't take that effort. They just are still looking at the same old things that we have always been exposed to. So it's really important to for us as a society to take these matters very import or very seriously and understand the importance of us being controlled by very few versus having things opened up and having uh, a more free democratic society. So we're going to talk about that and what this all means. And she really gives a good uh, uh, view of what that organization is doing. And uh, I think uh, it's um, something that I want to continue to look at as things go on. Next year, they're going to be focusing on who really controls the media and who are the owners of the media in different countries and what that means to freedom as well. And I think that's really important for people. Look, I'm surprised it's taken this long for 
any organization of substance to really look at that because it's so obvious that the people that control it are the ones that are making all the decisions and and they're making decisions for us and to be uh an educated aware electorate or society we we have to have freedom of the press so right now i'm going to welcome delphine to the program to discuss uh, their index freedom of the press index and reporters without borders hi delphine welcome to the program hi sarah thank, thank you for having me yeah you're welcome i've been wanting to talk to you for a while i probably ever since i saw the your index, your Freedom of the Press index that you put out in February. And you're with Reporters Without Borders. And can you just give us a, a little brief ev- overview of what Reporters Without Borders does and how you're set up independently? Mm-hmm. So Reporters Without Borders is the largest press freedom organization in the world. Uh, we were founded in 1985, so 30 years ago. And so now we have offices in uh, 12 countries. Our headquarters are in Paris. Um, but we have a network of 150 correspondents in 130 countries. These are local journalists uh, helping us to report every day on press freedom violation, but also then to defend and assist um, the journalists on the ground to help them to continue to, to do their job. So how do you get the funding for what you do? So we have uh, three main sources of of funding. So the first source are private uh, funding. So it means private foundations, private individuals. So the foundation could be some like the Ford Foundation in the U.S., but actually a lot are from Northern European countries. Okay. Um, The second part are public funding, which comes mostly from the European Union or the Swedish government is an important donor, but we do not accept funding from the U.S. government. And why is is that? Because I've never been accused to be a Swedish government agent, but I'm already, I can, it's it's just um, the U.S. government money is not always well perceived when you're trying to do uh, human rights work. So we don't just to not be accused of working for the U.S. government or to try to keep an uh, independent voice and to not be seen as based in our work. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, and, so, and as I said, I've never been accused to be a Swedish agent. But, yes, but people, people accuse you of being an agent in the United States. British intelligence or whatever it comes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the United States is ranked 49 out of 180 countries on your last index. So for priding itself in freedom, that's a pretty low ranking. Why is the U.S. so low? So yes and no, uh, in a sense. So you're right. The, the United States are ranked at the 49th position in our World Press Freedom Index. So most of the Americans are very surprised about that. Why we're not first? Uh, actually, well, no. I don't. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people aren't surprised that we aren't first because yes. ex- if you've been paying attention, but. Uh, but so the, the, the point that I want, why I started by saying yes and no is that first, I just, before bashing, don't worry, I'll come to that. Uh, at first, I just want to say that in this first part of the index, the scores of the countries are very close to each other. So the U.S. is still in the kind of good part of, of the index. So, so the bottom just, of the good part, right? No, so what I mean is that we are still far away from countries oh, like North Korea or Turkmenistan or Iran. So, yes, just, but saying that, it's true that uh, we have observed many things these recent years which are concerning uh, in regard of press freedom in a democracy like the U.S. And really our main concerns and uh, which explain this uh, ranking at the 49th position are, if we want to, to sum up, are two main things. First, it's we have observed in the recent years, um, many times journalists have been arrested 
while covering demonstrations. So last year it was uh, especially during the the protest um, in Ferguson. So we re we at least 15 journalists were arbitrarily arrested during the confrontation between the police and the demonstrators. And even even if they are clearly marked as journalists, they still get arrested. Yes, there's been uh, many cases of journalists clearly identified as journalists. The police knew they were journalists, but they were arrested. So, which is just things which should not happen in a in a democracy. And unfortunately, we have seen that in 2014, but we continue to see that this year in 2015. So that's one concern which really remain high. But the other main concern is really what we called. Uh, here, the kind of war against uh, journalist sources or war against whistleblowers. You probably know that the Obama administration has uh, prosecuted eight alleged whistleblowers, which is the highest number under any previous administration combined. And what are, what are they prosecuting them for? So they are prosecuting them under the Espionage Act, so making the point that leaking valuable information to journalists is an act of espionage. So mm -hmm. this is a, a first concern for us. But what is really concerning for us in regards of press freedom is that in a country where almost all information related to national security is classified and secret, exactly. the only way to know... Another part of the story than the official PR press conference truth is it's leaks. Leaks are really the lifeblood of investigative journalists. Well, because if, uh, if everything is classified, then how do we, there's absolutely no transparency. Exactly. And even uh, very high level people in the U.S. government like uh, I, former Attorney General Eric Holder, acknowledged that there's too much documents classified, too much information are classified in this country. So it's, it's, it's very hard to get to know what the government is doing. And actually, uh, we, when I say we, it's Reporters Without Borders, but dozens of press freedom organizations have wrote many times to President Obama and to um, its uh, administration to highlight our concern to prevent important information from getting to the public. And uh, we, we highlighted the fact that um, journalists are prohibited to communicate with government representatives uh, without going through the PR services. The, P the government um, now kind of have this uh, way to always ask the interview questions uh, before uh, allowing an interview to happen and really controlling and controlling more the information that go the public can know about the government. And isn't, isn't it true that only certain journalists can get into meetings and things? You know, when they do press conferences, they really control what organizations are allowed to even cover it? Uh, that, I think, it really depends on at which level we are talking about. I think, again, we are still in a country where press conferences are open, but then access to certain government representatives can be more and more difficult. Uh, or uh, we, uh, we have heard also of the example of pictures of the president are more and more controlled or, or things like that. So, How much does the fact that tight control of the media – by a small number of corporations affect the freedom of the index? Because we have few companies that own most of the media in this country. So how does that get factored into your index? Yeah, so right um, in our press freedom index, uh, we take into account many uh, criteria. Uh, we measure the degree uh, to which opinions are representative in the media, so the pluralism, media independence, environment and self-censorship, legis the legislative framework, uh, the transparency of the government or the quality of the infrastructure. So we really try to, to take into account all, all these factors 
plus um, the number of journalists who are arrested, uh, killed, imprisoned, who had to flee their countries. Because once again, um, it's maybe not the case in the U.S., but we really try to to make um, a broad comparison all around the world. Um, so we 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 try to take into account um, the the lack of pluralism or, or this kind of thing. But because we observe that uh, the concentration of media ownership is, is definitely a, a concerning trend all over the world, we are actually uh, starting a pretty deep um, analysis uh, on this issue, as I say, all around the world with uh, um, deep academics review and things like that. And uh, it's what we see in the U.S. with the kind of big six, as we call them, so the big uh, six um, media uh, groups, uh, which are uh, Walt Disney, um, uh, News Corp, Comcast, uh, Time Warner, Viacom, and CBS. We really cover a majority of the, of the media. Ninety and, plus percent, correct? Yes. Uh, I don't have the exact percentage, but definitely a, a, a large majority of the media. Um, so we observe that in this this concentration of ownership in in many many other countries, like in France, actually. It's even more dangerous right now than ever. We really see a concentration of uh, the main French media in really one small end. And we are seeing that now the owners really uh, succeed to not make some documentary getting broadcast or really it, the impact is much more visible than, than in the U.S., but it's definitely a concern concerning trend that we observe all over the world well, and, how, and especially in democracies. Well, how much, how much does the, the owners of this media own the media in other countries as well? Um, I have to say that I don't have specific data yet on that because really we, 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 we expect to get uh, the first uh, analysis worldwide uh, in the in the next months and uh, so I, I cannot really answer that right now but for the but moment that, is that it, one of the questions you're trying to figure out is okay we know that the United States has six big ones that own the majority of all media that goes out but uh, how much is the world's media owned by a select group of people and how do they all tie back together yeah we will look into that but for the for I, I really Right now, uh, the example that came to my mind are really kind of national focused, where we saw the impact of this small group of owners was more um, national consequences than. Uh, but as I said, we we started this really large overview now, and we will have the first result in the coming months. So I don't I don't want to. Start. So that's the that's the next step, right? Is to, okay now. Where does it funnel up to the next level? <laughs> yeah. You are listening to Business Game Changers, and we need to take a short station break. Get ready to experience Truth Talk Radio with host Deb Acker. Tune in to Truth Talk Radio each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com to illuminate the truth in your daily life as you experience life, love, and abundance from a whole new perspective. This hit show will leave you feeling lighter and bring you into a place of infinite possibilities every day in every way. Visit TruthTalkRadioShow.com for upcoming transformative topics and guests. Welcome back to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall, and I'm talk talking to Delphine Helgen from Reporters Without Borders. Okay, well, is the government pretty involved in the media from your research? Do they have, like as, as reports that you'll see, do they actually have correspondence or people from the CIA or FBI and things like that actually in these different media groups? Uh. I have no no facts or no investigation on this, so I I, I have I, I cannot really comment or add any expertise on on this okay. issue. So, do you do you have any research on how it negatively affects freedom of business 
you know, the a free market? Mm-hmm. So no, no, not yet. And, uh, and and again, it's because we want to explore this question that we started this large analysis and I don't have the results yet, but I can just say that even if we can consider it an issue here in the U.S., you know, I spend most of my time trying to work on uh, issues in China or in Eritrea or where the control of information is at a completely different level. And in countries like China, where there is almost complete control of the information, where there is almost non-independent voices, uh, yes, we can see a evident impact on, on the business. How can uh, an American company invest um, in China without being sure that they know what is really going on. And so I think that's one of the strongest illustration we, we can find uh, to understand why business need to, to know what is really happening. Well, it's kind of scary, too, because if they decide they don't want you to be successful there, they can just decide. <laughs> they You don't get advertisements. You don't get – you just don't get press. And you are uh, – bad mouth in the press they can wreck your reputation very quickly that's one thing but it's even stronger if you are if you want if an american company or anybody wants to invest in a control in a country where there's no independent legal system oh, how yes. can you sure uh how can you make sure that you, your investment will be protected in case of um a legal dispute or, or how can you know that uh, your factory uh, is not on a completely polluted zone if you have no way to know anything about the environment uh, in this city or this kind of thing. So um, I think it's, it goes much broader than just um, the, the press by itself. When you restrict press freedom, when you restrict freedom of information, you just restrict any freedom to do anything. Well, back when the printing press came on board, it took about a century to, um, you know, 100 years for it to really penetrate through the, you know, the environment. But the countries that really limited the use of the printing press are still feeling the economic effects of that today. And there's some studies based on, on that. The ones that were much more free in its use are much farther advanced economically which is very interesting so we're going to be going through that same thing now because this is a this is a very a second renaissance with this huge media communication that we're going through and the the countries that really try to shut it down and not embrace it are going to feel the economic impacts just based on historical you know history tends to repeat itself and that's the one example that we have mhm no well, de- definitely and a couple questions. Well, I have lots more questions for you. I, this is really interesting for me. What specific examples, uh, you, you named some of them, but what's, what specific examples have you seen that's lowered the United States ranking in this past year? So um, I think I start, we started exploring that, but I'm happy to go more into detail. So when I was talking about the, the crackdown of the U.S. administration against whistleblowers, um, it goes uh, behind um, the theories, actually. A New York Times journalist, James Risen, was threatened to go to jail until uh, last January because he was refusing to give up um, the name of uh, one of his sources. So a, a New York Times reporter, Pulitzer uh, winner, was for actually almost during 10 years threatened to go to jail. And actually his alleged source, uh, a former CIA agent, is now in jail. His name is Jeffrey Sterling, and he was sentenced um, earlier this year to three years in prison for allegedly uh, providing classified information to the New York Times journalist, James Risen. But what is very concerning in this case is that Jeffrey Sterling was sentenced to three years in prison under the Espionage Act, only under uh, only on circumstantial evidence. Oh. What I mean is that the proof that 
yes, he was in touch with James Ryzen. Yes, they had phone conversation and they exchanged emails. But there's no proof that he gave classified information to this uh, journalist. So the fact that he was in touch with the journalist was enough to sentence him to three years in jail under the Espionage Act. So that is a very concerning uh, fact in a democracy, that um, someone can be sentenced to jail just because he's in touch with a journalist. Because he talked to somebody. So yes. that, that points to our justice system having some issues and being tied to the government in a way that's not not part of our Constitution. But it looks like there's a, a battle against sources almost more than journalists. Yes, it's because uh, it's, in a sense, easier to go after the sources than the journalist. Because in the case of uh, James Risen, when he was threatened to go to jail, hundreds of newspapers and people actually, uh, 100,000 people signed a petition um, on his behalf to address to uh, Attorney General Eric Holder. There were many press conferences to explain press its support. How can you jail the New York Times journalists on things? You know, it's it's easy to get um, really um, behind this kind of uh, uh, story, but it's more difficult to get public support and attention when you're a source, when you are the one who really took a risk because you thought that someone was going wrong in the government. So, it, it, and so that's in, in a sense why we have seen such a crackdown on the journalist sources or alleged whistleblower because the government um, really also want to send a message to potential future whistleblower to, to really make them understand that if there's any leak which are not uh accepted by the government, the government will go after you and in a very harsh way. Well, with everything being confidential, top secret, it, it makes it so difficult. I know when the source for Bernie Madoff came forward, he was very careful to disguise who he was for a long time until they decided to actually go after him because he was worried for his life. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's very common, and I just can't remember his name right now. I wish I had that in front no, of me. No, but there's many examples. We can also think of John Kiriakou, the CIA officer who is known because he made, he, he made public uh, the waterboarding methods, and he was accused to be a whistleblower, and he had to to make a plea with the government, and he went to jail. Um, we can think of Thomas Drake, a uh, former high uh, official of the NSA, who was accused to be a whistleblower because he expressed uh, his concern about uh, some uh, some of the NSA operation. Um, and the list goes on and go on. The next w last week, a big uh, leaks uh, was on uh, how the U.S. government uh, is. Uh, is work, uh, it's a kind of detailed analysis on the drones attacks. Uh, so there's someone in the government who didn't, who wanted to make more information public. So they, you have leaks all the time of, on things which I think are, uh, of public interest. I think the American public needs to know more about, uh, how the U.S. government decide how to kill people through drones or, or things like that. What well, do you think what Julian Assange did with WikiLeaks was illegal for him to do if he got that information and he published it is that because i know the united states is going after him hard mm -hmm. so there um i think that julian assange uh helped to make public some information which were were of high uh public interest value uh but at the same time i value the fact that some uh, whistleblower cooperate with the media to make sure that the information that are published are not injuring anybody and are put into context. And that's what Edward Snowden did. A big difference between Julian Assange and Edward Snowden is that Edward Snowden didn't publish anything. He gave the information to journalists who then and uh, filtered it, put it into context, uh, 
even uh, negotiated with the NSA on what could be published when and so on. So that's a big, big difference. And you, uh, of course, there's some information which cannot be revealed because that could put people into danger. But I think uh, in the case of Snowden, he he trusted the New York Times or other journalists to put um, this valuable information into perspective. And we saw the impact of this information now with the Congress really working on many of the surveillance issue and, and so on. He's being really, uh, got, he, there, he's being hunted down too by the United States. What What is your stance on that? Um. My my main you know, the, point yeah, he's, yeah, my he's main, a whistleblower, my main right? My point is that leaking information to professional journalists is not espion, an espionage act. And until right now, if he would come back to the U.S., he would be uh, sent uh, prosecuted as a spy. Yeah, they'd nail and him. <laughs> he'd be in, when, he'd be in prison forever. Yes. <laughs> Most certainly. So I think the U.S. government and other governments should really re- <laughs> look at a, at a new way to to deal with this um, with the whistleblowers and really value the impacts and see how actually these people were um, ready to give up everything to 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 really abandon their their comfort comfortable lives because they they could not stand the government to do something wrong so they should we should better value and concentrate on how to make the country and our governments better than to see how we can put one or two people in jail for revealing information we are all glad to know exactly we have to take a short station break we'll be back in a moment A word of caution, if you prefer the status quo and you are not interested in improving every aspect of your life, this book will trigger the shift out of you. The Truth is Funny, Shift Happens is available now. Author Colette Steffen brings the powerful knowledge and life-changing energy and empowerment from the radio airwaves to the pages of her new book. To get your copy in paperback or ebook, visit thetruthisfunny.com today. Hello, we are back with Business Game Changers on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and Conscious Business Radio, and we are continuing our interview now. Well, the U.S. has been lower in the past. They were as low as 53, and now we're at 49. Uh, and, but we've also, within the last like 15 years, we've been as low as 20. Have you seen the United States just continually to trend lower? So, um, in a sense, yes, the U, the U.S. position varies in the ranking uh, in this last 15 years. So we started the index in 2002, but again, the U.S. remains in this first part of, of the index, so the kind of best first quarter. Uh, and the these changes uh, are due to specific concerns, like we say, the arrest of journalists, uh, the crackdown on sources. But, you know, to explain changes like between 49 and 53, it can be also the, um, if the ranking of other countries are moving, then it can explain some small um, difference. But uh, the the U.S. has been, uh, the position in the Press Freedom Index is, is also very important because uh, the U.S. are actually a model for many, many countries. So, you know, when when we see that uh, a country like the U.S. abused kind of the, the concept of national security protection to crack down on journalists, uh, don't worry, many other countries are happy to use the same yes, uh, I'm sure. language to crack down. So we see that uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, Turkey are really using exact kind of really similar language to say, oh, but you know, we are protecting our national security like the U.S. do. So that's why we are cracking down on journalists. Oh. <laughs> so that, that's... It's that's not a good thing. A... <laughs> we, lead, we lead more than we realize sometimes. Yes. So anything the U.S. do, bad or wrong, and especially wrong, 
people, uh, other countries are happy to, to do the same very quickly. Well, I, I've also noticed, and you stated it on your website, that even the top countries are starting to trend lower. Just pretty much everyone have been have been trending lower. Why is that? Yes. So it's it's actually one of the highlights, which is the, the, I think the most concerning, is that this last year we we really observed a, deter, a deterioration of press freedom of in, of press freedom and freedom of information all over the world. Um, and really two thirds of the 180 countries surveyed last year uh, didn't perform as well as the previous year. And this decline affected all continents, including uh, Europe. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a concerning trend overall. And there, there's many reasons to explain this, this trend. So first of all, uh, conflict uh, proliferation proliferated in 2014, especially in Syria, Iraq, and Ukraine. So, of course, when now there's a, a, a conflict on the ground, we always observe an information war. And, and more than that, as you are aware, journalists have been targeted and have been used in this information war, like, of course, the carefully staged beheadings of American journalists. But unfortunately, we see this trend um, again all over the world. Actually, the, the number of journalists kidnapped uh, these last two years is 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 increasing in, in, the, in a comparable way. Um, now we observe most of the kidnapping in Syria, but in Iraq, Libya, Ukraine, and now in Yemen. So it's definitely the, this raise in the number of journalists kidnapped. This do you is, think it's um, would you think it's tied to the our economic problems or or war? Whenever there's war, does does things tend to go down, or is it more the economy that's struggling worldwide? I think uh, for the kidnappings and the targeting of journalists during war is definitely a new thing. Uh, I hear again and again that, oh, while, while I was covering uh, Bosnia or even Iraq, being a journalist was a protection. Now, being a journalist is a target. So it, I, I think it's more linked to the fact that now with um, the Internet and the social media, anybody involved in a conflict can or want to control its own information, its own propaganda. So you, they don't want independent uh, journalists who can report the truth. <laughs> Whereas before, and, they, a journalist being there would just help their cause because they have to get the information out somehow. Yes. Now they can get it out themselves and they can craft it exactly how they want it. Exactly. So, you know, the Internet has really helped freedom overall from some perspectives, but this is an example where it, it isn't helping. Yeah, what, what we have seen is that... The, uh, you, we all know that the internet, uh, of course, uh, helped tremendously information to circulate. But what we observe is that now, actually, there's as much journalists in prison than bloggers in prison all over the world. So the power of internet becomes also um, a risk for uh, news providers. Uh, you don't need to be a professional journalist uh, now to be targeted for the information you circulate, and and that's uh, that's definitely a new a new thing that is pos- that is a reality because of the internet. Well, do you see disinformation agents all over the internet? Have you done any research on that? Yeah. So when I was talking about. Um, The fact that when now you have a conflict on the ground, you have an information war. So these so-called information wars are, you can see them in in Syria, in Ukraine, uh, in Gaza. or So it means that each party involved in the conflict will try to get its own propaganda out and kill the other, the opposition propaganda or something. So you will have some games of uh, disinformment and things like that, especially on social media and so on. Well, yeah, because if they plant somebody in social media, it really can make a difference. 
Yeah. And and also, if a few media companies own the press, the the coverage that you're going to do is only going to be good for those businesses. They're not going to allow, I wouldn't think, anything that would hurt sectors and industry. Have you seen that? Yeah, but because I'm more thinking of conflict where states are involved and I'm more thinking of uh, media. I'm, I'm more thinking of media owned by states uh, than I, so I have more like states example than a business example. What I mean is by example, in Ukraine, um, one of the key points of the battles were as soon as the um, supporters of Russia were in control of a town, they would rest- cut all the Ukrainian TV channels and just bring back all the Russian TV channels. And the same happened when the Ukrainian forces were taking over a new city. The first thing they would do was to cut the Russian TV station and bring back the Ukrainian meet, uh, TV station for the population. So that's this kind of war of information I'm talking about, which is really more like states oriented than uh, companies oriented. Now, how accurate are, is the state propaganda anywhere? Is there is there <laughs> a country that actually puts out their own propaganda that's kind of accurate? Or is it all skewed? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny question in a sense, and uh, it's hard to answer because uh so if you look at uh the russian uh media or they they will tell you that that they present the the truth in and so everybody thinks that they're presenting the truth even if yes. they know that they're not they're it's yeah. they're always making it look more rosy <laughs> but but you know then it's uh, one example is that bbc is a British um, media, but I think it's a pretty everybody respect the BBC in a sense, or uh, and so it, it's not always because you are uh, state funded that you are based, or uh, or you know some uh, Arabic speaking media would say that anyway, any Western media, even independent, is based because we have a Western view of looking at the world, so. Then what is a biased view? Is any media ever could be completely fair and unbiased? Uh, it, it's actually hard to, well, yeah, to answer. Yeah, fair and balanced only from your perspective. Yeah, right? from your you have, Western perspective. Well, yeah, because you have ingrown biases that you don't even realize you have. Just the way you make a statement is biased yeah. without even you knowing it and trying hard not to. <laughs> yes, well, what do you think about ridicule on certain subjects? Because there's certain subjects that people are afraid to even cover because they're laughed at and ridiculed. You know, like the people who are questioning 9-11, they're called truthers and laughed at. Whether it's new paradigms and new scientific theories, they're laughed at. You know, it'll take a, a new theory and science can take, you know, 30 years before they're treated treated seriously and they might end up being right but they're laughed at and, and abused during that process especially at first you know alternative me- medicines aliens you know everybody's laughed at if you even try to cover it seriously mm-hmm. what do you think of that well i think that um if like 10 years ago a serious journalist would have say hey, you know you should better be careful of your webcam because it, it can be turned uh turn on uh, by distance or you know your phone can record all your conversation and they we would have think that this person is crazy but after edward snowden uh, revelation we know that it's actually very usual <laughs> so it's true. Um, so what is what seems crazy one day can be a complete um, accepted truth the next day so um that's why we <laughs> we should value debate and information circulation to always know more about uh, about what is really going on but then after saying that uh, i think there's will always be crazy theories as well so oh yes there's always these people out there that are very creative in their thinking they're o- they're almost too open minded <laughs> right <laughs> 
You should, yes. but, but it's you should at least listen and go, okay, I don't see much there. And <laughs> I'm, it makes me think of actually um, Noam Chomsky that I interviewed recently. Yes. And he was saying and something that uh, I, really, I think I will remember. He was like, when everybody agrees that something is true, you should really ask yourself is, if it is true. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's probably because true. Because... You are listening to Business Game Changers, and we need to take a short station break. Hey, Owen, I just heard about this book on the Dr. Pat Show, and these reviews on Amazon are amazing. Oh, yeah? What's the book? It's called Conscious Being by T.J. Woodward. Oh, he's the awakened living radio host. Yeah. This book looks like just the guide we've been looking for to really connect and make those conscious changes in our everyday relationships and experiences. I love it. Can we get it on our Kindle apps? Of course. To learn more about Conscious Being and author T.J. Woodward, visit ConsciousBeingBook.com. Welcome back to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall, and I'm talk- talking to Delphine Helgen from Reporters Without Borders. Then you you don't even think why uh, are people considering anything true? Like uh, why is Iran a threat? Why? Um, so just go to wonder why and list the facts and uh, for for anything. Yeah, if they if you don't have the facts for it, then you is, is it just propaganda? I also think if you see somebody who's very serious and it's very probable and they're presenting very factual, they're very, um, they present it very professionally and they're really trying to dig in, into facts and researching it, I don't know why we wouldn't at least try to take it, take them seriously in the sense of trying to listen and keep our mind open to see what it is that they're presenting. And I think we, we as a society shut people down too quickly who are presenting things in a way that seem credible. Yeah. And we, you know, as a representative of an organization, we defend freedom of, of information. I can only say that, so yes, we should uh, encourage debate and information and, and to, to, to just uh, reinforce our democracies. There was, uh, um, do you know who Graham Hancock is? I'm sorry, but I don't. You know, he's very interesting. He's r- written a book about the fact that he believes that uh, there was a more advanced civilization of humans that we say it was us essentially, but we were much more advanced 10, 15,000 years ago. And there was cataclysms that hit the earth and mm-hmm. wiped out, you know, the not wiped us completely out, but wiped us almost completely out. And that's why there's architecture found all over the world that's more advanced than even some of the stuff that we can do today. They had different technology, right? And you can see the architecture was very advanced, and then it was a lot less advanced just 5,000 years ago. So, you know, he's trying to answer those questions. But he was talking to the the top researcher in Egypt. He's in charge of the, you know, the Egypt's research on, you know, archaeology. And he was supposed to debate them, and, they, and that's this is how the internet has changed the world. He started pretty much throwing a tantrum with this guy because he presented some facts that he did not want him to to present. And he said that he's the final word on this stuff, and and, and this and so it's on the internet. And Graham Han- Hancock is like, well, I think we should be able to openly debate this, and he just completely threw a tantrum like a little kid. And it was, it's, it's funny to watch. And I think that's the example of, of having, having control in the wrong, you know, in not being mm-hmm. mature about it, not lo- looking at different, I don't know if Graham is right or not, but he has a lot of interesting things that we need to look at and facts that he's presenting. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. We should always encourage debate. Well, I uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I've been wanting to do, like I said, I've been wanting to do this interview for a while. When is your next index coming out? Uh, next February. Okay, so that will be on what happened in 2015, essentially? That's correct. And what do you do to keep your reputation clean? What does the org- <laughs> you know, because it's hard, because who's to say who, who who's backing you guys, you know? Yeah, like you being right. accused of being an agent of the United States. 
Well, I'm actually, thanks God, more um, encouraged to continue to do my work than um, uh, accused of doing wrong work. But uh, I think the, the best way to 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 get a good reputation is to do good work. So as long as we continue to defend uh, journalists uh, in the U.S., in Eritrea, in China, we we keep, and I think the most important is to have a good reputation uh, for this uh, journalists who are pretty much unknown and who are really risking their life to, to do their jobs. Well, I think also having transparency so that we know what you're putting forth is done you know, it's transparent. So we see how you're going about getting the information that you're getting. I think that's important. You, you guys do, you publish all that, correct? Yes. Yes. We have a full-time statistician working on this index. And again, uh, we always trying to uh, improve the transparency, uh, the, the science scientific aspect of it. And, uh, and to expand our network to get more and more people involved in seeing and discovering uh, or on sharing our work. And and can people donate to your cause? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then, it, we, we are five hundred one c three in the U.S., so we accept, uh, of course, any individual donation. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, and I will have your information uh, for your organization up on my web page and my radio page and i wish you good luck going forward thank you so much saha and have a good weekend yeah you too bye-bye well thank you for joining me today and i think this was a very timely and important discussion that we had i'm going to continue tracking this and seeing where this goes as they come out with their next index i I think it's important also to be aware that we have to know who's behind all these different organizations and understand what whether we're being fed propaganda or whether we're being fed truth. And it's really hard to know the difference because all of us are mar- – any business person is – understands marketing and that we need to push our agenda forward. All of us have probably had anybody who runs a business has had marketing experience. You know how to send your messages. You're doing things for a reason. And and as an enlightened business person, you know that that's happening from all directions. So it's important for us to be able to see other means of media, other sources of information so that we can get the full picture. And this this has to continue if we want to make this world a better place. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck with just the renegades coming forward with their own, you know, propaganda and weird things. And we're not going to get the the good people who are just trying to get the information out there to, to be able to do that unless we have freedom. And freedom of the press is one of the things that are, is a pillar of a democracy. If we really think that we have freedom in this country, we better get our freedom of the press in order. So that's it for now, and I'm very happy that you joined Business Game Changers today. You can always go to my website at sarahwestall.com to see my latest episodes and all episodes that I've ever done. Excuse my first ones that aren't the best that I've done. <laughs> Actually, you know what? They're very good interviews. It's just the the intros and the the stuff that I do beforehand is kind of bad. But I don't care. Everybody starts off somewhere. My, I think after about my 15th show, I get a lot better at it. So I, I think I'm into my 70th show now. So I have quite a bit of episodes up there and some really top-notch people in industry, business CEOs, entrepreneurs, uh, people in politics and government, all all sorts of areas of our society that are important to to talk talk about and to dive into. So once again, thank you for joining me on Business Game Changers, and I hope you have a wonderful day. You've been listening to Business Game Changers with host Sarah Westall. Tune in each Monday at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, as Sarah brings you leading experts, visionaries, and newsmakers who provide the best commentary on big issues and cutting-edge innovations. Sarah's 20 years as a business executive will help you think like an entrepreneur with expertise, energy, and attitude. 
Tune in Mondays at 12 noon Pacific time. And learn more about Sarah at sarahwestall.com today.